Lord, we pray for Helen this morning as she opens up the word for us. May our hearts be open and our ears ready to hear all she has to tell us this morning. In your name, amen. Good morning. Um, You might want to keep that reading open in front of you because we're going to go through that passage this morning. It's exciting to be here at Christ Church at the moment, isn't it? Uh, We're taking time to ask the Lord what he wants to do here among us and with us. And we're in the process of seeking his vision for our church and community. It's a new season. I don't know about you, but it feels like we're at the start of an exciting journey, a bit of an adventure. And we don't know at the moment where we're going or what it will look like. We know that God has a plan for this church. We just need to discover what it is. And to help us to do that, Tim is asking each of us to read a chapter of Acts every day. And why Acts? Well, it's here that we read about the birth of the early church, how God did it, how the first disciples responded, what they got wrong, and there are lots of lessons we can learn from this. This feels very loud. Is that, is it, it is very loud. Come forward. Um, So by my reckoning, if you've been reading a chapter a day for the last couple of weeks, you should have covered today's reading earlier this week. It's quite a familiar reading, and it's easy to pass over it quickly without really seeing what we can learn from it. What what can we learn from this here in Bushmead in 2020? Incidentally, I think it's a good year to be seeking clear vision with 2020 vision and all that. So let's look at our passage this morning. And I'm really, I'm just going to go through the passage. Just to set the scene, you will know that Paul, who was called Saul, has set out from Jerusalem with permission from the Jewish leaders to arrest or put to death those who had put their faith in Jesus. He was very energetic in this and was on his way to Damascus where he knew there were believers to see what damage he could do. But on the way, the Lord met him in the most dramatic way, a blinding light and a question, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Interestingly, Paul responds by calling him Lord. He was instantly on his journey as a follower of Christ. But the immediate result of this dramatic encounter was that Paul lost his sight and had to be led to Damascus by his companions, where he found himself in the house of Judas in Straight Street. And just to give you a picture, history tells us that this was a very upmarket area of the city, a bit like maybe Regent Street in London. And here, Paul prayed. Now, at the same time in Damascus, was a man named Ananias, who was a believer and a member of a local fellowship, and he had a vision. We don't know if this was a dream or something he experienced as he was praying, but God quite clearly spoke to him, telling him, not asking him, to go and find Paul and lay hands on him. Now, when I read of Ananias' response, I was reminded of John McEnroe. You cannot be serious. You see, Paul's reputation had preceded him. Everyone knew that he was out to get Christians. He was a dangerous man to be avoided at all costs. But God was deadly serious. You see, he had a plan that was in, mind, that was in his mind from the beginning to offer salvation to everyone, the Jews, the Gentiles, every nation and people group on earth. And Paul was going to be a vital part of that plan, especially in telling those outside the Jewish people of God's love for them, his forgiveness of their sins, and the promise of eternal life with him in heaven. And we can see this in some of these readings, if you can see them. Genesis 12, the Lord has said to Abraham, leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. And that's right from the beginning of the Bible. Then a bit later on, Isaiah says, he says, you will do more than restore the people of Israel to me. I will make you a light to the Gentiles 
and you will bring my salvation to the ends of the earth. And then Paul, later on as he uh, writes to the church in Rome, says, But now, as the prophets foretold, and as the eternal God has commanded, this message is made known to all Gentiles everywhere, so that they too might believe and obey him. So there was Ananias. I wonder why God chose him. There's no mention of him before or after this event, but we do know that he loved God. He was a member of a local fellowship, and he was open to hear the Lord's voice. And then he was obedient. And these things are key if we want to play our part as the Lord begins to reveal his vision to us here at Christ Church. But he wasn't all that enthusiastic, was he? In fact, he was probably terrified at what God had asked him to do. Had he heard right? Well, we're often in the same boat. We think we may possibly have heard something from God, but is it just our own thoughts or a reflection of something that we've read somewhere or somebody else has said, or even too much cheese late at night? But Ananias did the right things. He sought confirmation of what he thought he had heard, and God graciously showed him part of the plan for the salvation of the world. And when we're not sure if we've heard right, then it's good to ask for confirmation, either asking God to confirm it, or perhaps asking a trusted Christian friend to pray about it, or as we're doing now here at church, as we seek God's vision, submitting our thoughts to the leadership for them to weigh. And then Ananias was obedient. He put aside his own views and went and found Paul. We don't know how the conversation went, but we can imagine that Paul confirmed what God had told Ananias because he'd also been praying and God had shown him that Ananias would be, praying, would be paying him a visit. And this must have been such a relief to Ananias and confirmation that he had done the right thing in obeying God. And as we continue to ask God to show us his plans, how might we react if he asks us to do something we don't want to do or we don't feel equipped to do? Perhaps something that takes us right out of our comfort zone as a church or as individuals. What if God wants us to lay down something we've been doing? Perhaps something that gives us value as an individual. Something that we enjoy. And that's when it starts to get tricky, doesn't it? At the first of our prayer evenings a couple of weeks ago, we prayed the responsive covenant together. And I don't know about you, but there are some very difficult words to say here. I don't know whether you just said them, but you know, it makes me take a bit of a gulp when I read some of these words. Let's just go through it. I am no longer my own, but yours. Put me to what you will. Rank me with whom you will. Put me to doing. Put me to suffering. Put me to suffering? Put me to suffering. What are we saying? Let me be employed for you. Let me be laid aside for you. Let me be exalted for you or brought low for you. Let me be full. Let me be empty. Let me have all things. Let me have nothing. Let me have nothing. I freely and wholeheartedly yield all things to your pleasure and disposal. And now, glorious and blessed God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you are mine and I am yours. So be it. And the covenant now made on earth, let it be ratified in heaven. Those are hard words. They're really hard words, aren't they? And perhaps it's a good opportunity in your quiet time or in your home groups to really consider what these words mean and whether you're really willing to say them. Ananias was willing. How willing are we? But we don't need to be frightened to be obedient. God's plans are good, even if they are a bit daunting sometimes. Ananias did as he was told, and Paul's sight was restored. So what if God asks us to do something we're not ready for? Well, I've got a friend, and we'll call her Eileen, because that's her name. And she was 80 last year. 
Just a few years ago, she felt God was asking her to set up a seniors group in her church, but she wasn't that keen. She felt she'd done her bit. She'd served God in a whole host of ways. She was tired. She had some health issues and a husband who also has some serious, serious health issues. And for quite a while, she resisted. Even when some of her Christian friends began saying to her, I think you should consider running a seniors group. But thankfully, thankfully, she eventually submitted to God, and she now runs lunches, group sessions for the bereaved, and has even taken away groups on holidays. She still finds it tiring, but she's filled with joy as she serves in this special way. Now, as we go back to Ananias and Paul, Ananias faced yet another challenge. He had to introduce Paul to his local church. You can imagine the conversation. I'd like you to welcome Paul. He's new to our town and church. You might recognize him as he's been in all the papers as a person from Jerusalem looking for Christians to arrest or kill. Now that would be a challenge for any welcome team, wouldn't it? <laughs> but here again, Ananias was instrumental in helping the church to accept Paul, to baptize him and allow him to teach them. Allowing them to teach them. Imagine that. Somebody new comes in and starts teaching. How do we feel? So we've been praying for an increase in our numbers. Are we prepared to welcome, accept, and love anyone who God sends our way, whatever their background? It's easy to say yes to this, but it's not so easy to do, is it? But if we've prayed and God answers that prayer, then we need to be prepared to welcome anyone he sends our way. And that's the last we hear of Ananias. He's never mentioned again in the Bible, but he played a vital role in implementing God's vision for the world, as laid out to him in verse 15 of today's reading. It says, But the Lord said, Go, for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings, as well as to the people of Israel. So now we turn our attention to Paul. He'd had a dramatic experience of the Lord, both in his Damascus Road experience, but also in his healing encounter with Ananias, presumably where he was told what he must do, as described in verse 6 of our reading. But this didn't mean that everything was going to go smoothly. Paul would have faced antagonism from every side, from Christians who were afraid and distrustful of him, and from the Jews who were furious and considered him to be a traitor. And as we receive God's vision for our church, we may experience a bit of a bumpy ride, perhaps from those inside the church as well as outside. But Paul was obedient and boldly told everyone he could about Jesus, the one promised by God to save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray, as the carol goes. Offering forgiveness for things we do wrong, freedom from guilt and shame, and a place with him in heaven when we die. He did this immediately. He didn't wait to go on an alpha course or to attend an evangelism training course. He believed there was an urgency in telling people about Jesus. And experience shows it's often the newest converts who are the best evangelists. Paul eventually faces a threat to his life from the Jews, and the believers help him to escape from Damascus. That's verse 25 in our reading, but what's not clear is that there are around three years until verse 26. And we read about this in Paul's letter to the Galatians. He says, But even before I was born, God chose me and called me by his marvellous grace. Then it pleased him to reveal his son to me, so that I would proclaim the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles. When this happened, I did not rush out to consult with any human being, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to consult with those who were apostles before I was. Instead, I went away into Arabia, and later I returned to the city of Damascus. Then three years later, I went to Jerusalem to get to know Peter, and I stayed with him for 15 days. So at some point, he realized that if he was going to fulfill his calling, taking God's love to the Gentiles, 
he would need some more input. His was a new sort of ministry, and he needed a firm foundation to understand the link between all that had been taught to him as a serious Pharisee, the Torah, the law, the writings of all the prophets, and this new way of Jesus. He needed to be able to explain to those he met that Jesus was the fulfillment of all that had gone before. And to do this, he retreated to the desert for three years, where he says that he received this knowledge directly from Jesus, presumably through his Holy Spirit. In Galatians, he writes, Dear brothers and sisters, I want you to understand that the gospel message I preach is not based on mere human reasoning. I received my message from no human source, and no one taught me. Instead, I received it by direct revelation from Jesus Christ. And as we continue with this process of seeking the way forward for Christ Church, it may be that God asks us to do something completely new. And this may require training and equipping before we are ready to go out there. We may need to be patient in some areas, be prepared to spend some time reading, listening and learning, perhaps visiting other churches to see how they do it, or going on courses. Now this could be sacrificial, but it would give us a firm foundation for the future ministry of our church in a particular area. And the most important thing, as Paul example shows us, is to continue to seek God and to be obedient to him. Sometime after his three years in the desert, Paul arrives in Jerusalem to make his acquaintance with the apostles. And he again, he again faces suspicion. But Barnabas comes to the rescue. His name means son of encouragement. And he certainly encouraged both Paul and the apostles, acting as a bridge between them until Paul was accepted. It says he went around preaching boldly, and this is the mark of someone who has been filled and is continually filled with the Holy Spirit. And as Tim has said on a number of occasions, it's something that we need to do if we're going to be effective for God. And we certainly can't do it in our own strength, can we? But we can for a while, actually, but eventually we'll get worn out and we won't be especially fruitful. In addition, our reading says that Paul went around with the apostles, and we need each other to work together on occasions. We need the wisdom and insight of more experienced members of the church family, as well as the energy and enthusiasm of new believers. Here again, the Jews in Jerusalem were out to get him because they could see that he was being effective, and they plotted to murder Paul. And wisely, the believers helped him escape, not because he or they were frightened, but because they knew that God wanted to use him powerfully. Sometimes it's better to retreat and move on if things aren't going well. In verse 16 of our reading, Ananias is to tell Paul that God will reveal that for him, being in God's service is going to mean suffering. It says, and I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Is it possible that we might face suffering as we follow God's plan for Christ Church? Absolutely, it is possible. We will certainly find, face opposition from the enemy. We may face opposition from individuals or organizations, even from the wider church itself. It is likely that for many of us it will be costly in time and perhaps financially. But we can take courage from Paul, who even though he, went, he underwent all sorts of threats and danger, persecution, physical pain, the list just goes on, he continues to write of the joy he finds in serving God in obedience. So even though it may be tough at times, we will be able to say with the psalmists, I take joy in doing your will, my God, for your instructions are written on my heart. And praise the Lord, how joyful are those who fear the Lord and delight in obeying his commands. Our reading today ends with the results of Paul's obedience. The church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, Galilee and Samaria, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. 
Isn't that what we want at Christ Church? To see our church, maybe not our, just our church, but others in our town, to grow in the knowledge of the Lord and to grow in numbers. So as we come to the end of the reading, let's just recap about what we can learn from this passage. We need to be available to hear God. We need to be obedient, even if it's difficult. We need to get on with it when God speaks. We may need to get some training and spend some more time seeking God. We need to welcome new people, however different they are from us. And you can just take time to think of who might it be that's different. Somebody who's been really antagonistic to the church comes through the doors. Somebody who used to be here but has slipped away. Somebody who's been through the criminal justice system. Somebody from a completely different culture. Somebody from a completely different faith. We need to expect opposition. And we need to regularly ask God to fill us with his Holy Spirit. So finally, are we willing as a church and individuals to play our part in bringing about God's plan for Christ Church, bringing his love to the people of Bushmead and beyond? Amen.